I want to begin with something that a lot of us in this room can identify with. Some of you, bless your hearts, you haven't passed that realm yet. Hopefully you don't have to. Our eyesight. Our sight's precious, isn't it? We like the ability to see and we don't really realize that it's been compromised until something happens and we suddenly, I've got to have glasses or I've got to have surgery or something else has to happen. I was in the fourth grade, could not see the blackboard. Didn't realize I had a problem, I just, it was a little blurry and my mom took me to the eye doctor and sure enough, I had to start wearing glasses. Hated those things. Still don't like them, but they are a necessary evil, if you want to call it that, in order to be able to see you and to be able to see what I'm reading and, and, and sharing with you this morning. And you know, the interesting thing about our eyesight or anything like that is we, we really like being able to see and to pick things up, to be able to discern what's going on around us. But imagine trying to describe something that you can see to a person who has had never been able to see. Well, it's green. What color is green? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, or red, or the sky is blue. Well, what's blue look like? I've never seen blue. I don't know what colors are. And so you can't, you can't. And then shapes, you start saying round. Well, it's rectangle. Well, it's oval or whatever. And unless they can put their hands on it and fill it in their mind's eye, they really cannot discern the shapes or even maybe dimensions. You say, well, it's about three foot long. It's about 10 foot long. I have no clue what you're saying. I don't know how long that is. I'd have to be able to fill it out. Imagine what it would be like if you had a person who had not ever been able to see and suddenly for the first time they could. Can you imagine how emotional a moment that would be to see for the first time, to recognize things you've never seen before, to put a face with a voice, to put a scene with the sound that you hear, water rushing by or traffic going down the road, to see all of that. You know, from a spiritual standpoint, there are many around us today who are blind. There are things that have been going on that they do not see, have never really perceived, have not taken in. Why? The blindness is a result of Satan's deceptions in our world. It is something that Paul brings out in a letter that he writes, his second letter actually that he writes to the church in Corinth. You find it over in chapter 4, there beginning in verse 3. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, he says it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case... The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Satan is busy blinding people from a spiritual standpoint so they don't see what God is doing. They don't understand what Christ has done. They have no concept of all of the things that you and I sit here week after week and discuss and study and talk about and, and have learned for some of us since childhood. But yet again, it's God who gives them the ability to see the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, three verses later, verse 6, or two verses later, verse 6. He says there, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He is the one that gives us light. He's the one that enables us to see. Or another passage, one that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, chapter 1, verse 18. He's praying a prayer. And part of that prayer, if you'll notice there in verse 18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know or will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Paul says, I want God to open your eyes, the eyes of your heart, so that you can see what God is doing, how God is working. And you know, it's important for every one of us here this morning to open our eyes and see what God has been doing in this congregation 
for a number of years now. And to be grateful to him because he is doing such more that we probably have not really taken in. If you were listening to our text this morning, one of the things you may notice is that Jesus is dealing with a lack of understanding. The disciples are unable to comprehend what he has said to them. Not that they can't hear him. Not that they don't understand the words. They understand the words. They can hear everything he's hearing, saying plainly, but they are not getting it. They are not, as that's what we would say today, you, you, I just don't get it. I don't get what you're saying. I hear your words, but I don't know what you mean by those words. So I want us to take time and look at what Jesus says to these men because he takes them aside from the rest of the crowd and he's telling them something that's important, something that they need to pay attention to, something that they need to recognize. But even more, what is it that he wants us to see? What does he want us to take in from this? He says, or Luke records for us, that as he takes the twelve aside, and he tells them, we're going up to Jerusalem. They've been making their way to Jerusalem for some time now, if you, if you kind of follow through Luke's gospel. He's been roundabout way, but his destination is Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem. I'm taking the scenic route, but he's, he's got some things that he will have to do, people that he needs to see, things that still need to be accomplished before he gets to Jerusalem. And then he makes this statement, and all the things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Son of Man is not a title that someone had given to Jesus, that others had appropriated to Jesus. It is a name that he actually gave himself. Have you ever gone back and just read some of the Old Testament and seen where that, that came from? If you were to go back, you would find if you were just to take, and first of all, here in the Gospels, I say he applies it to himself, 83 times as you read through the Gospels, you're going to encounter that, that term, that title, Son of Man. If you go back into the Old Testament, we find it even more. It's 26 times here in Luke's Gospel alone, but it has a rich history. And the place that you want to go back to, the one book that it is really where we want to focus is Daniel, but before that, Ezekiel. Ezekiel comes, I know, after Daniel, but Ezekiel has it 93 times. It's God's address for him. And when God uses it, it sets him apart. God is identifying him. You've got two terms that are used in Ezekiel that should stand out. One is the Lord God, or some translations have sovereign Lord or sovereign God. But then the other term, and it's always applied to Ezekiel, son of man, son of man, son of man. What is God saying to Ezekiel? He's just calling him a descendant of mankind. He's calling him a human being. But it's a term that he uses for him to identify him apart from who God is. But it's also a meaning that is found 14 other times in the Old Testament. One time it's applied to Daniel over in chapter 8, verse 17, where he is referred to by God as Son of Man. But the time that I want you to focus on this morning is found in chapter 7. Because in chapter 7, the, Daniel is recording for us a vision that he has. It is a vision of what lays ahead in world history. And it is graphically represented, as you're reading through this, this vision, there are four beasts that he sees and finally it culminates with these thrones that are being set up and upon one of the thrones there is someone who is referred to as the ancient of days who is that it's God himself and God himself is sitting on this throne God himself is sitting on the throne in order to bring judgment upon the nations but as we go through this as he ends the vision there in verse 13 Daniel begins telling us, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days, he says, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is the Son of Man that Jesus is referring to. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, he came to this earth as one who is fully human. So in one sense, those that were listening to him, oh, you're, you're using Ezekiel's term. You're using the words that God used for Ezekiel. But he also is not just fully human. He is fully God. And so he uses this title not to say, well, I'm like Ezekiel or I'm like Daniel. But he is using this title to say, I am that eternal sovereign king that Daniel saw who received the glory and the kingdom and the dominion from the ancient of days all the way back in his vision. That's who I am. That's who I am referring to when I use this term. And the first time he used it is all the way back in chapter 2 of Mark's gospel. Because there in Mark chapter 2 verse 10, there is the paralytic then Capernaum that's been brought to him. And he's let down, if you will remember, they tear up his friends, tear up the roof and let him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, first of all said to him, your sins are forgiven. And of course the Pharisees are questioning who can forgive sins but God alone, who is this man? But then the next thing that Jesus says to him is this, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, arise or get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And of course, as you remember, he did. But it's what Jesus says to his disciples on this occasion that was just read for us this morning that I want you to go back to. Everything he tells them that was said of the Son of Man by the prophets must take place. What was said about what was to take place? What prophets were he, was he talking about? I'm going to connect you to two this morning. I want to draw your attention to them and see what they say. One is David in Psalm 22. The other is Isaiah in Psalm 53. In Psalm 22, you're familiar with that psalm because the very first thing we have in the beginning of the psalm is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And David says, if you look at the psalm and you see some of the things that David says, you realize David isn't talking about himself. This is someone else. But if you also remember, the prophets spoke about things they didn't understand, things in which angels longed to look. They, who, who is this I'm speaking about? Who is this I've written about? God knew and so did his son. He was speaking about Jesus who was to come the Son who was to come in flesh. And what he was telling us is one of the things that is said about me is that I'm going to be forsaken even by my Father. Another thing, if you look down in verses 7 and 8, there are going to be those detractors who are going to sneer at me. Because he says, all who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head. They're saying, commit yourself to the Lord and let Him deliver you. Let Him rescue you because He delights in Him. And that's exactly what happened as He hung on the cross. He also, in that psalm, lets us know that he was going to be crucified. Verse 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. David wasn't speaking about himself. Who was he speaking about? He was the only other one that could be, the one who would eventually die for our sins. And then the last thing that we can draw from that is in verse 18. If you'll notice, he says, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing cast lots. That's exactly what the Roman guard did that day as he's hanging on the cross. They're dividing his garments and they're casting lots for the one, the tunic which was of one piece as to who might have that. And then there's Isaiah. And if you go to Isaiah chapter 53, it's often referred to as the suffering servant passage because Isaiah is telling us what's going to happen seven years, 700, excuse me, 700 years in the future. David has prophesied of things that are going to happen over a thousand years in the future from the time when he spoke these words. The prophets of old were foretelling this is what's going to happen to the true son of man. What did Isaiah say? If you look at verse 5, and and we're not going to read all of Isaiah 53, but notice verse 5. He talks about being beaten. He says, He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and 
By his scourging, we are healed. Well, we saw that this morning, didn't we? In our reading, he told about that. And though he would be challenged time and time again to give a response to the questions and the things that were being said to him, one of the things that Isaiah had said about him, if you go back and you look at verse 7, is that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Time and again, beat, slapped. Blindfold on him, they'd slap him. Prophesy, who hit you? He knew exactly who was doing it, but he didn't say a word. Are you the Christ? Only once did he finally concede that and acknowledge it and say, and you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And not only that, the fact that he would be crucified, because if you go back to our very first verse, verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. But while he was innocent of all of these charges, he would be crucified between two thieves. And the interesting thing, and I'll be honest, I did not pay attention to that until I was actually going back over this sermon last night, reading through it yet again, and suddenly something just hit me, and I don't know why, but it just, for some reason, noticed this. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Do you know what typically was done for somebody that was crucified? Typically, people wouldn't claim the bodies. They would be cast into either a mass grave or a pauper's burial. He was assigned with the wicked. That was what would have taken place. That's what normally would have happened. But notice what Isaiah goes on to say. Yet, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. What happened? Someone went to Pilate and requested his body, Joseph of Arimathea, and he buried him in a tomb that had never been used. He was with a rich man in his death. If that's not the providence of God at work, I don't know what is. But when Jesus said the things that have said about the Son of Man that must come to pass by the prophets of old, not only did he tell them these are the things that the prophets of old have been saying, but then he comes back and he's reiterating it himself as you've already seen. And what is he saying that we see here in verses 32 and 33? He will be handed over to the Gentiles which is exactly what the Sanhedrin did. They wanted Pilate to take him and crucify him because they knew they couldn't get away with that. Under Roman occupation, the worst they could do was stoning. They wanted something far worse. He was handed over to the Gentiles. Pilate, Herod, back to Pilate. He will be mocked, mistreated, spit on, scourged, or scourged, scourged, exactly what happened they mocked him hell king of the Jews put a purple robe on him crown of thorns on his head mocked mistreated beaten slapped spit upon and that final beating before he was carried to the cross they will kill him which you and I know is exactly what took place. And on the third day, he will rise again. Do you realize this isn't the first time he told these men this? It's not the second time. It's not the third time. At least not according to Luke. It's the fourth time. And that's just four times that Luke has recorded for us because if you go back in Luke's gospel you go back to chapter 9 and what you find there is the first time in Caesarea Philippi right after Peter has declared him to be the Christ you're the Christ the son of the living God we find there in verse 22 
Jesus says this to these men, his disciples who are gathered there. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and raised up on the third day. I mean, he's already told them sometime before, this is what's going to happen to me. And then there was the second time. It's after the transfiguration on the mount with Peter, James, and John, where, as you remember, they saw Moses and Elijah, and then they came down, and at the foot of the mountain, there is this man, and there's this crowd gathered around, and this man comes to them and asks Jesus to heal his son, who is demon-possessed, and it casts him down and causes him to have convulsions, and he does. And then he says... In verse 44, let these words sink into your ears. Have you ever said that to somebody? Let this sink in. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't miss this. What is it? The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. What do you mean? Let it sink in. Dwell upon it. And then there's the third time. It's something we looked at just a few weeks ago, back in chapter 17, after his response to the Pharisees concerning when the kingdom of God was coming. And in verse 25 he says, But first, he, again the Son of Man, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And the thing is, all of this was necessary. All of this had to happen. Do you realize that? It had to happen. Why? It had to happen because it was only through his death on the cross that he could become our atoning sacrifice. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, after he talked about the gospel that he had preached to them, he comes back and he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, what? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This is exactly what the Scriptures said would happen. Christ was to die for our sins. Or what you find Peter saying later in his first epistle in chapter 2, he himself, that is Christ himself, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Why? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then he adds this, for by his wounds you are healed. He had to die. He had to die because apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of our sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the writer there says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then there's that last thing. You know, he had to die, he had to be buried, he then was raised from the dead. It had to happen because without his resurrection, you and I here today have no hope of eternal life. In that great chapter on the resurrection that we've already touched on, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you drop down from verse 3 to verse 13 and 14, you find Paul there saying, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. He says, if, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, I'm wasting my time up here. And you're wasting your time even being here. Your faith in a risen Savior is in vain if he's not risen from the dead, but we know that he did. And then what Peter would even write in his first epistle over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have the opportunity for a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. Now I say all of that to bring it back to this last verse because three times Luke says something. He says it three times in one verse just in different ways. You know what he's saying? Jesus said all of this and they still didn't get it. <laughs> 
They didn't get it. And here's the way he says it. Three times, first part of verse 34, the disciples understood none of these things. Middle of verse 34, the meaning of the statement was hidden from them. End of verse 34, they did not comprehend the things that were said. How long had these men been with Jesus? Three years? More? Night and day? And yet they did not understand what was going to occur, even though he had told them and told them and told them again. Why? I think the reason they didn't understand it is it wasn't because they didn't understand the words. It wasn't because they they couldn't hear what he was saying. It was because they could not see how a Messiah who had healed the sick, who had raised the dead, who had calmed powerful storms, and who had fed thousands would allow himself to go through such torment, who would allow himself to die. That just doesn't fit our understanding of the Messiah. That's not the Messiah we think thought of that's not the Messiah we understand from Scripture and if you even look after the resurrection you may remember the two disciples on their way to Emmaus and he had to again expound to them from the scriptures what was to take place and when he he once again meets with the disciples after his resurrection in the room there in Jerusalem behind doors that are locked and he appears to them and he says as Luke records it for us in chapter 24 and verse 44 he says this he says these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled This is exactly what I was talking about. This is what had to take place. This is what I kept telling you over and over and over again. And they still didn't understand it until, if you look at verse 45 of Luke 24, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. My question for each of us this morning They didn't understand it, do we? As you sit here this morning, as many of you have sat here year after year, week after week, time after time, listening to sermons that have been preached by others who've stood in this pulpit as well as myself, do you get it? Do you understand Jesus approaching suffering and death in Jerusalem was no surprise to him. He knew it was coming. The scriptures had promised it. Jesus had foretold it himself. The things he suffered, he did so willingly, knowing knowing what his death, burial, and resurrection would ultimately accomplish for us. He didn't do it because of himself. He did it for us. He did it because it was the only way for any of us to ever have the opportunity to see God. The only way for any of us to ever know eternal life, abundant life, anything beyond what Satan has rendered to us in this world. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we understand that there was no other way, there is no other way for us to be saved, to enjoy the eternal reward that he came to provide other than what he did on the cross for us? How often have we heard somebody say, seeing is believing? You had to be there. You had to see it for yourself. But here were men who not only saw, they heard, and they still struggled to believe. And as Jesus had pointed out to his disciples, not only had the prophets of old told of the things that would happen, but he had confirmed it as well. And the question for each of us today is do we read what the Holy Spirit has placed before us and preserved for us and still not believe it or not accept it? When you pick this up, do you read it with a desire to understand, what are you trying to tell me, Father? What is it you want me to see in your word? What is it you want me to hear? What am I to believe? If you will... Study, ask, seek. You know, he said, if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, you will receive. If you knock, the door will be opened. 
Are you doing that in your own life? You know, it's vital. We sing a song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus except to trust and obey. How many of us have done that? Trusting in his promises and in what he tells us and obeyed his word and done what he said to do. Maybe you're listening to this today and you say, you know, I've heard it. I've heard others preach the same thing you're saying today. But my question is, have you obeyed it? Come to Jesus, he will save you. Though your sins as crimson glow, we sometimes sing. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it white as snow. Come, come today. Do you need to have your sins washed away in the blood of Christ? Do you need to turn to him today in obedient faith? If you do, and if you're willing, will you please come as together we stand and sing?